Welcome back, everyone, to Fox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and I'm delighted today to be able to speak to Frank Hanna, co-CEO of Michaelmas Brick, a leading premium brick manufacturer in the UK, with roughly around about a 5% um, share of the overall market. So welcome, Frank. Nice to see you, Paul. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, good, yeah. Well, big congrats on the recent uh, positive AGM trading statement. But before we sort of dig into the details, just for a layman like myself, I don't suppose you could quickly run through a, what the key difference is in a, a premium <laughs> Michaelmas brick and a sort of standard breeze block, which is more I'm familiar with. Well, uh, bricks are very much produced from, from clay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the definition of a brick is uh, fired clay. Um, we do many shapes, sizes, uh, colours, textures. Um, there's, a, there's an enormous array of things that set us apart. You know, we've got seven highly recognised brands in the sector, um, and they're very distinct and unique in many ways. Um, they're generations old, mm. um, and many of our bricks have formed part of the UK and European and wider built environment for, for, for many, many generations. So you can see it in our vernacular all, all around us, you know. Yeah, so they're, they're sort of like more aesthetically pleasing and uh, more sort of unique. They're not your standard bricks. So where would you where would you use them in terms of, would they use them sort of like entrances for buildings to show a showcase a building and foyers? And um, we, we do a lot of that kind of thing. We do a lot of bespoke work. We do a lot of mid to high level housing work. We do a lot of commercial work. We do schools and shops and offices, um, yeah. education centres. If you look through the uh, website and look at the galleries and the projects, we're involved with they're very uh very heavily design led in, in many parts um we are involved in many innovative projects um, we do a lot of um uh, panelized systems which require a traditional brick cladding uh solution to them yeah so there's a myriad of applications but okay. um we like to think we produce probably some of the nicest colors oh, okay the Okay, good. Well, I mean, just for a, sort of a bit of an idiot like me, in terms of the, you read about the the press and you've got sort of like lots of people going for race for space and buying bigger houses with more sort of like your home offices and wanting to do lots of sort of their own um, repair and maintenance and improve the quality and the aesthetics of the building. How are you how are you seeing that angle of the premiumization, the the sort of like um, people going up market as well as the sort of the strength of the overall market? I mean, you must be really sort of like uh, having to churn out as many bricks as you can at the moment. Yeah, we're on full production capacity. Uh, our model has always been and always will be, you know, we, we work to uh, full capacity because that's the mm. best way to maximise the output and the unit manufacturing cost of the plant. Yeah. But, you know, we are seeing clients and customer bases become more discerning. Uh, yes. and that, that, that's self-builders, end users, architects, um, house builders, you know, they are looking at what they're producing and trying to make it more visually appealing. And that is driving uh, much of the narrative towards brick. And the other thing to consider as well is if you look at the life cycle of brick, it's hundreds of years. Yes. You know, you've got EPDs at the moment which are rated on 60 years. Um, you look at brick and its life cycle. It, it, there's instances of brickwork all around you in your built environment during the day, you know, of 120, 130, 150 years plus. You go around London, there's three, four, five hundred years. Mm. I was at Hampton Court yesterday with my kid, mm. showing him the brickwork. He was a bit bald, but <laughs> <laughs> I was like, look at that. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, 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 so what you're saying then, basically, is that when you actually put in a, a new build and you put in the sort of the, the bricks and stuff, then, I don't know, 25 years, 30 years down the road, and they want to do a bit of repair and maintenance and sort of like put in some similar bricks, then effectively what you're saying is they, they, they probably have to go to you guys because they can't get something similar because it's so unique. One of the things we're very good at, I mean, some of the others do it as well, but one of the things we're very good at is where, if you, if you consider that, go back to, say, 2007, 2008, we had around 80 plants in the UK, mm. we're now down to 50. But in the olden days, every every town had its local brickworks. Yeah. Uh, what we have done is very successfully copy some of the bricks that are no longer available from some of those plants. Mm. Um, and that drives our RMI. Um, so that's a, a key part of our business. And the RMI is the repair and maintenance. How, how much yeah. is how much is that of, of the sort of like of typically of your sales? I did see Canaccord have got sort of like 
we're building about 55 million of sales for this year. And I think it was about 52 million last year. So that's a sort of yeah. 6% organic growth. Where, it, well, how much is RMI of that sort of broadly in terms of percentage, 40%, 50% or? Roughly we're doing about 50-50. So half's going into new build housing and what have you. But, you know, we will then do, you know, try and do half into um, our builders, merchants, the RMI sector. Yeah. And so is your volume then, I mean, I know if, you, if you're running full tilt on production, I know you were running full tilt in production pre-COVID, never mind now. So are you sort of like, um, you're back to pre-COVID levels? You must be. If not, yeah, we are. Higher. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we, we um, wound the business down during the COVID pandemic for about four weeks at the end of March in 2020. Mm. And I mean, in essence, that took out a month of production. But the team works fantastically hard around the clock. Yeah. To look at how we could bring all the factories back uh, in a safe way. Uh, and we've, we've taken a lot of steps to deal with the COVID pandemic. And we were back up operational um, in about four weeks, really. So we didn't lose that much, but it was enough to make an impact on the 2020 numbers, obviously, which was disappointing. Yeah. But, you know, I think the important thing was health and safety, welfare of the staff, you know protection of all the stakeholders and um, making sure, you know, you're not being reckless with the business. Yeah, yeah. And then, then when it comes to sort of like just the big picture sort of drivers, I hear this stat from the government and Boris goes, boom, boom, I need to build infrastructure and housing. And they put this promise out, they're going to um, build 300,000 new homes each year. And I think they're currently doing about 200,000 or less. I mean, you know, I mean, that's obviously got to put a big sort of like tailwind across the whole industry going forward, I guess, is that we need, we're still going to have, even post pandemic, and given this, you know, sort of like the rush we've had recently, we've still got this huge driver for new houses, acute shortage. We have, and there's a number of um, issues within the whole model. If you look at it, if you go back over a 20 year period and have a look, there has always been a historic disconnect between housing formations mm. and housing completions. Mm. And on top of that, we've got issues such as um, it, an increase in population, uh, yes. there's an increase in singular occupancy, you know, um, there's a, a lack of affordable. Mm. Um, family homes yes um we did go through a phase prior to the last recession of building an awful lot of apartments but you know ultimately people want a little bit of green space they want somewhere where they can put their car and they'd rather be in a detached or semi-detached house you know at mm. slightly lower levels i mean apartments have their place in the sector without without shadow of a doubt yeah. but you know it's about building housing that's fit for purpose and mm. that's and also you know, you've got to look at the length of time that the housing stock now needs to last. Mm. And this is why we're, we're quite busy in the RMI sector. You know, as you said earlier, you know, a lot of people are spending money on their house and sort of refurbishing it and looking to add extensions, et cetera. And that's driving the brick consumption narrative mm. as well. Yeah, well, you can't, you can't get a de decorator, a builder or a chippy at no. all at the moment. It's absolutely impossible. And you, you mentioned you were doing sort of like cladding systems. Now, I'm guessing that yeah. is that dovetailing into things like Grenfell Tower, because obviously they've now gone to much harder and, uh, you know, requ requirements, much tighter requirements and regulations in terms of fireproofing. And can you just talk yeah. through that opportunity? Yeah, I mean, it's something we've been involved in for a while. Uh, anything over um, 18 metres now ideally needs to be A0 rated, which is nil combustibility in terms yes. of fire. Um, but they were really pretty much the only schemes that we've been involved with. So if you look at the cladding systems that we do, they're backed on to um, in the main concrete and, and steel footing systems. Yeah. You know, so you, you've got a uh, traditional, more of a traditional brick and block work kind of um, proposition or brick and concrete proposition on the panelized systems. Yeah. Um, if you have a look at in our investor presentation, we've got some good illustrations um, of where we've done some, you know, quite complex off-site cladding systems and cladding yeah. projects. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is the pre the, the, the Michelmerch sort of like, you know, cladding solutions are not only 100% fireproof and so meet the tightest of all regulations, but they're also very aesthetically pleasing, which is really if you're yeah. building a big sort of like, you know, block of flats or or doing something or build to rent or something like that, then it gives you the, the it, it looks good to the eye and gives you all the uh, the performance that you actually need, which is fun. So, yeah. so, so putting all that together in terms of, 
you've got incredible demand at the moment. If we, I mean, we're obviously going to get this. The stamp duty is not going to be um, the holiday. The stamp duty holiday is not going to continue. But, but frankly, it's, it's probably going to be a, a, a welcome respite to you guys if you're flying. Just so you can, I mean, you, your stock levels must be pretty low at the moment. So I'm just guessing that you're going to have it'll give you it'll give you just a, a bit a chance to sort of like come up for air and try and build a few bit stocks. Just in a and if, if, if there is a temp, not a, it won't be a slowdown, but it'll be less less strong growth, I guess. I think the thing with stock, it's nice to have, say, around three months stock on the ground, and that gives you the opportunity to take advantage of some near-term orders and just-in-time yeah. delivery, et cetera. But, um, look, we've got some products that are out on 10 to 12 weeks availability. You're going to have to wait. We've got other well, we've got other products which you could have next week. So there's quite a cross-section, but our stock is a bit low, and it's probably lower than I want it to be. Yeah. However, I think what you'll find is as the sector has got busier and busier, the better value for money products within the whole sector, you know, started to go mm. uh, and it's starting to move up the price point, you know, yeah. people to accept well that, okay, they can't get that at that price point. They're going to have to spend a few quid more and yes, buy the next product up, you know, uh, but we're starting to see, you know, some shortages in those products as well. So it does have a knock on effect. Mm. And so how are you seeing pricing at the moment? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing because you have long term sort of, well, I, I, I don't know, but I'm just guessing you probably have long term sort of annual contracts with some of your distributors. Then uh, there will be a time lag because you, you're probably like everybody else seeing a bit of price um, in, input price inflation in terms of energy and stuff. But but frankly, you know, um, recovering that is just as a time is a timing issue. Yeah, I think that there's a mixture of things at play. You know, input, input costs are going up in some areas. I think energy is going to come into play because I think the cost of energy is, going to, is, is going up without a shadow of a doubt. Um, we have affected the price increase. We, we did some deals during COVID to ensure that we were busy and um, we have had some COVID costs to take mm -hmm. on board. Yeah. So, you know, on some products, we've had to look at some price increases at some of our plants mm. um, at the midpoint of this year, you know. So the market's aware of it. Um, we've got other customers that are on an annual contract. We've got other customers that are on a project by project contract. So it's quite, yeah. a, it's quite mix, a mix. Is it? Yeah. 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 But you'll probably get the, ch the full chance to sort of like to equalise the cost in, you know, basically cost pricing <laughs> equation will be next year, I guess, when, it, when everything sort of rolls over. Yeah, historically, if you look, um, brick companies, you know, uh, tend to look, take a bit more of a longer view. Yes. Um, when you look at the ONS stats, you know, it tends to be on a rolling annual basis. And that's really, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that as well. Don't forget, we like to give our customer base consistency in terms mm. of, you know, price strategically. to strategically, yeah, it's yeah. important. Yeah. You know, they yeah. can't, but you can't have the same customer uh, paying different rates for bricks on sites that are sort of within two minutes of each other as well. You know, so you, there, there's a lot of um, ensuring you, you, you capture some loyalty as well. You know, it's important to do that. Yeah, and it's it's basically long term goodwill, isn't it? It's basically if you stand by your customers longer term, then they'll stand by you going forward as well. So it's a sort of bit of a print quo quo, I guess. But ultimately, I mean, you know, I think you should see some price traction in the next six to twelve months without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. yeah. So big picture wise, then let's just assume that Boris is right and the housing market still stays relatively strong because there's, there's the secular fundamentals. I think everybody knows are very, very sort of positive for it. What, what's the sort of like the board's view in terms of increasing both organically capacity? And obviously M and A because you did fantastic deals over the last five years with Carlton, I think, back in 2017, yeah. and, and, and Florida in 2019. Yeah. So, how, what's your expansion sort of like um, uh, strategy? Well, as you say, we've got we've got two uh, elements to it, and that is the organic growth, um, mm. and that's where we look to improve efficiencies at our plant, at one of our particular plants, and we have, you know, we've got. Um, several things on the drawing board at the moment and they will be, tend to be our bigger plants yeah. uh, where we can uh, improve our output capacity there. Um, so, you know, we'd look to deploy some CapEx then. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if there's other opportunities to grow the business, um, we'll, we'll have a look at those. You know, you know, you, you tr you've seen this. Yes. Tracked us, you know, so if there's... You've got a, a good track record. <laughs> you've got a very good track record. I'll give you that. Well, we, 
if there's a deal to be done and it looks right and it fits well with the business, then we'll do that. We tend to go for, you know, asset backed, you know, mm. um, those kind of acquisitions. You, you yeah. need minerals to make brick. Yeah, and complementary to your actual yeah. product portfolio, yeah. and you know that geographical split, which is uh, which is important as well. But uh, there's other opportunities in associated space as well. But they, yeah. it has to complement what we do and yeah. be part of our core competence. Otherwise, we won't do it. And equally, yeah. as you know, you know we're quite risk averse. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, you've got, I mean, you've got a very cash generative business. I mean, that's one yeah. of the features I think of Micklemer. So it's spinning off a lot of cash when you after you bought. Um, Carlton, you 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 generated so much internal cash, you paid that off within about I don't know two years, and then you've done the same effectively with with Florida in in a pandemic. So it just shows you how successful that is. And I I mean just just for investors, I ran the numbers, and if you use a comfortable two times EBITDA and your forecast from Canaccords where your net cash is, you got about thirty million of, of debt capacity um, that you could you could deploy internally, externally, or, or however you uh, you know you, you, you choose to do. So uh, that's obviously you know something which is uh, something to look forward to. In terms of trading, then going forward for the rest of the year, I, 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 can you just talk us through that? Because you said you were firmly in line with um, expectations, which obviously demonstrates mm-hmm. quite a bit of confidence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've got a good uh, forward order, but we've got some good visibility on it, you know, so yeah. it, it, we, we're not wedded to any one particular sector too much, you know, so we, we've got, like you say, we've got some mm. new housing, we've got some RMI, um, we're probably going to start seeing some offices being repurposed, uh, we're doing some self-build work, we've got a very strong quarry level from our architectural database at the moment, you know, they're quite busy at the moment as well, which, which, is, which is encouraging, and, and not just with, you know, um, cladding type systems you know it's, it's a lot of traditional brickwork yeah so <clears throat> when we look at our order intake for the last um for q1 and going into q2 you know we've got some good visibility of where we think we're going to be for the rest of the year okay well good well i mean just longer term for investors i mean you've managed to sort of like double um, double capacity over the last five years so uh if i just sort of hypothetically said you managed to do it again you'd be uh, you'd be hitting revenues roughly at about 100 mil or slightly more in five years that's obviously my view and it's very hypothetical and there's nothing out there so and use a standard 25 percent ebit margin you know, you'd be getting 25 million of ebitda on a standard multiple, even I can do the maths of 10, which would be 250 million compared, which would give you a share price of about 265. So uh, significantly higher than currently today. Anyway, that's a mathematician doing it. So I won't hold you to that, Frank. But well, uh, we, do, we do set ourselves these targets in terms of, you know, when we look at our flight path, we look to see where we want to be, you know, what's yeah. the benchmark of where we want to be in output and does that work for us? And, you know, is that right for the sector? And is it the right product for the sector? Yeah. So, you know, um, we have got some thoughts of where we want to go. So it's, yeah. very, it's very clearly mapped out. Yeah. Well, I, I know you've had a track record of being the board's very ambitious in its outlook, but uh, conservative in its guidance. So uh, I think pe- exactly. investors, should, invest, investors should sort of like uh, think along those lines. So just finally, then, in terms of possible news flow going forward, you're obviously going to have you've had your trading update for the half year. Yeah. Uh, pre, it's prelim September time or something like that. Yeah, no, beginning not prelim, of sept- it's interims, interims. interims are beginning of September. Um, and you know, we, we can update the market then. We've got Ryan's joined us as a um, new yes. CFO. Um, yeah. and that's been a key, um, mm. key signing for us. And he's uh taken over from Steve, and we've had a really, really good positive handover period. You know, um, and he understands the ethos and the culture of the business, he understands how Peter and I work. You know, and he's fitting in really well, and 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 already making you know real valuable contributions to business. You know, so yeah. um, whilst it is change, we're hoping from an investor perspective, you, you see no change. You know, and it's business as usual. Yeah. Um, well, I wish you all the best then for the next few months, and certainly towards the end of the year, because I know you're working full tilt. So I think mm-hmm. uh, you know, big tick in the box from uh, from investors. So well done, Frank, and uh, look forward in speaking to you uh, going forward. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for your yeah. time. And if anybody wants to sort of like follow Micklemurse at all, they can do by pressing on the button on the website. You'll get all the uh, important news, commentaries and articles coming straight into your inbox. So uh, that'll be marvellous. So all the best. Thanks. Thank you. Cheers.